home of this important family foundation now uh, since uh, Robert's pet him. Uh, when I was a fellow at Monticello, actually right after I completed my dissertation at the University of Chicago, and uh, when, when uh, he was dedicating Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, and I always remember what he said about the importance of the ideals around the founding of the United States, how they were ideals for all humanity to strive to be better. And, uh, and that's what he supported, uh, uh, you know, and the foundation has been a great supporter, of course, philanthropic, philanthropy, education, uh, uh, medicine, and many, many, many other things. So we thank them to being great friends of Mount Vernon for many, many years. As you all know, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association is a private foundation uh, dedicated to education and to the preservation of the home and legacy of George Washington. Uh, they've never taken any government money. Uh, and that's an important thing, right? And we continue that tradition of education tonight with the first of this, uh, this series. I also want to note in the audience tonight, we have uh, Kurt V. Brands, President and CEO of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, and his wife, Sissy, who will please raise your hand. And Sissy V. Brands. Okay. So uh, one administrative item that Stephen McLeod uh, has asked me to mention, uh, we did have a, a slight uh, typo in our pamphlet announcing the three lectures. The last lecture is Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf talking about their new book on Thomas Jefferson. It's on May 5th, 2016, which is correct, uh, but it's listed in the brochure as Tuesday. In fact, uh, May 5th is a Thursday, so we don't want any confusion and he asked me to mention that tonight. Okay, let's go ahead and get to the main event. Nick Bunker is our speaker, and he's gonna talk about his book, An Empire on Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. Nick Bunker is from England, uh, and he was educated at King's College, Cambridge, as well as Columbia University. He is a former journalist who worked for both the Liverpool Echo and the Financial Times. Uh, after his time as a journalist, Nick worked with Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation as an investment banker. Uh, I was joking with him earlier about how he needs to fund his own lecture series here, and we can have him back <laughs> all the time. Uh, he's the, yeah, exactly. He is the author of Making Haste from Babylon, A History of the Mayflower Pilgrims. Uh, he's traveled widely in China, India, and the former Soviet bloc. And tonight he's going to discuss uh, his latest book, An Empire on Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America, which won the 2015 George Washington Book Prize. He was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in history last year. As you all know, the George Washington Book Prize has emerged as the most important prize to celebrate works in early American history that make a substantial scholarly uh, as well as uh, a popular contribution uh, to American letters. Uh, it's an extraordinary prize, and Bunker was a great winner of it. I would have to say, as someone who's, who's trained graduate students in early American history for many years and who's written on the revolution, uh, this is one of the most important books to be written on the coming of the revolution in the last generation. It's not only beautifully written, but it's scholarly in its research. And the, the tribute to great popular history is historians who go back to the original sources and see them again uh, and explain to those of us who thought we knew what they were uh, in new ways. And Bunker really does that tremendously. He has an incredibly capacious understanding of the financial and political challenges that the British faced uh, in the final years of their dominion over uh, the North American colonies that, that ultimately would revolt and create the United States. But it's a beautifully written book, too. So you have the broad analysis based in documents, based in his own uh, career in finance, as well as journalism of politics. So a real sensitivity to those issues. He has a tremendous ability to paint the scene as he opens each of his chapters and then take the reader through uh, the personalities and issues which drove uh, inexorably to uh, Lexington and Concord. But I'll let you get the, the main facts from the man himself. Please give a big Mount Vernon welcome to Nick Bunker. <laughs> 
Good evening, um, and thank you very much for those very flattering uh, words of introduction. Um, and thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming this evening. Um, and thank you, Michelle Smith, of course. Now, it's not my first visit to Mount Vernon. Uh, I was here last year uh, to receive the prize and to uh, give, some, uh, give a little talk about the book. It isn't my first visit here, and judging by past experience, I would guess that we probably have a goodly number of people in the audience who have either served with the armed forces uh, or are currently serving with the armed forces or have some experience or some involvement with national security or homeland security, that kind of thing. And so for that reason, this evening, um, I will be talking about strategy. Uh, I'll be talking about grand strategy, uh, political, military, financial, and diplomatic. I'll be talking about the imperial grand strategy of Great Britain uh, in the 1770s on the eve of the crisis in America. And of course, what that means is I'll be talking about the grand strategy of that small group of men in London who made the key decisions. Principally, uh, Frederick Lord North, the British Prime Minister, and his colleagues in the Cabinet, and of course also the man to whom they reported, that is to say the monarch, King George III. Now obviously, if we're talking about strategy, British strategy in the 1770s, then we'll be talking about strategic mistakes, <laughs> blunders, errors, catastrophes. When I'm asked to give a description of an empire on the edge in a nutshell, I usually use one of two phrases. I describe the book as either a sympathetic study in failure or a tragedy of errors. The book does indeed chronicle a series of quite calamitous blunders made by the British uh, in the three or four years that led up to the outbreak of the fighting at Lexington. And the one I'd like to concentrate on in particular this evening is one of the most famous, that is to say the, the decision by Lord North and the East India Company, a decision taken jointly in the spring and summer of 1773 to send very large quantities of the company's tea to Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, New York. The decision which of course led to the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor on the night of December the 16th. 1773. Now the question is this that I'll be asking. What exactly was Lord North trying to achieve? Why did he want to send the tea to, to America in this way? Or to rephrase it slightly, how does that decision fit into the broader strategy of Britain at the time? Was it the case that there were fundamental flaws in the manner in which the British saw themselves and their empire? Were there fundamental mistakes which they made in terms of their conception of their place in the world? And was it the case that these fundamental mistakes led, if you like, with a kind of ghastly inevitability to the destruction of the tea in Boston? And the answer, I think, is yes. And that's what I'll be explaining during the course of this lecture. Now, I've come straight from the UK. Um, I arrived by way of Philadelphia last night, drove down this morning. And I just thought I'd briefly like to mention to you, uh, to share with you, um, something about a political drama that has been unfolding uh, in the United Kingdom during the winter months, and which has been keeping the nation enthralled uh, on the edge of their seats in front of their television screens. Now, I am not referring to the debate about our membership of the European Union or the referendum on June the 23rd, uh, to Brexit or not to Brexit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something rather more entertaining, which is this. Um, the BBC's television adaptation of Tolstoy's great novel, War and Peace. Now, I'm not sure when this will be shown in America. I mean, I'm sure it will be. When it is shown, I think you'll find it very entertaining indeed. Uh, it does take some liberties with Tolstoy, I have to say. Um, for example, it does include uh, some scenes that are not really in War and Peace. Uh, but let me put it this way. Um, if you, if you think you might enjoy the spectacle of uh, handsome young men and beautiful young women dressing up in furs and engaging in amorous couplings in the Russian snow, then I think this is definitely going to be the show for you. <laughs> now, <laughs> I mentioned War and Peace for a very serious reason, uh, and it is this. Now, the diplomatic history of the 18th and early 19th century is a formidably complicated subject. <laughs> 
I mean, I would defy any historian, uh, however experienced and however expert, to hold in his or her, her head all the details of the, the war of the Austrian succession, the war of the Spanish succession, the war of the Polish succession, and the war of the Bavarian succession. Those are the four succession wars that I can remember from the 18th century. So it's a formidably complicated subject. What Tolstoy does at the beginning of War and Peace is that he gives us a kind of a shortcut into the diplomatic history of Europe at the time. And although he's writing about the Napoleonic period, much of what he says actually refers also to the period I'm talking about this evening, the 1770s. Now, let me just remind you what happens at the opening of War and Peace. It's July 1805. Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, has outraged the courts of Europe, first by crowning himself Emperor of France, then by proclaiming himself King of Italy. He has added injury to insult by annexing the Republic of Genoa, and he has taken advantage of several years of peace to create a new enormous army, the Grande Armée, which is ready, when the time is right, to invade Germany. At the opening of War and Peace, what Tolstoy gives us is a party scene, a soiree, an evening party in the salon of a lady of the imperial court in St. Petersburg, Anna Pavlovna. And most of the discussions at this party have to do with the diplomatic situation. The big talking point is this. Will Russia and Austria form a military alliance to put a stop to French aggression? And one of the characters, who's a French émigré, says the following. And in these words, in, in, the, in the sentences that he uses, we can see the diplomatic philosophy of the 18th century laid out before us, as it were. He says this, he says, the means to achieve peace are these, the balance of power and the law of nations. He uses the French phrase, droit des nations, uh, droit des gens, law of nations. Then he says, let Russia stand at the head of a union, having for its purpose the balance of power and the law of nations, and it will save the world. Now, I appreciate it's a bit ironic to be talking about Russia saving the world, but there we are. Now, I'd like you to focus on two key phrases, balance of power and law of nations, because those were, if you like, the mantra of 18th century statesmen. What Tolstoy encapsulates for us in the discussions at the party and in those phrases is the official creed of 18th century diplomacy. And it was also the creed of Lord North, George III, and their colleagues and friends. And it was also this kind of thinking, particularly about the balance of power, that led with a kind of ghastly inevitability to the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor and the war that began in 1775. Now, what do these phrases mean? Now, the easy one to define is droit des gens, or law of nations, because essentially we still have it today. It was something that you could look up in textbooks in the 18th century, uh, textbooks by men with names like Grotius, Puffendorf, and Vattel. Vattel's textbook, The Law of Nations, was some of the favorite reading of Benjamin Franklin. And I think George Washington actually had two copies uh, on his shelves here at Mount Vernon, one of which I think apparently later disappeared. Um, now, the point about the Law of Nations was basically it's something, as I say, which is still with us. For example, you're not supposed to fight a war without actually a formal declaration of war. You're not supposed to wage war on civilians. One state is not supposed to interfere in the internal affairs of another state, except in exceptional circumstances. That was the kind of thing that was in the law of nations. So it's, it's pretty familiar. The balance of power is the difficult one. That's the one that is slippery and hard to grasp but it's also one that's important for my purposes this evening because it was so fundamental to British thinking about the world and their place in the world. And the essence of it was this. It was taken for granted that the nations of Europe, nowhere else mattered, of course, remember, I mean, they're only interested in Europe. It was taken for granted that the nations of Europe existed in a state of permanent rivalry and mutual suspicion. Each nation, it was assumed, would always pursue its own self-interest, however that self-interest was, was defined, whether it was dynastic or territorial or economic or a combination of all of them. The great example of this in the 18th century, which people referred to, was in 1740 when Frederick the Great annexed Silesia from Austria-Hungary. That was regarded as a great example of a country acting blatantly in its own self-interest. <clears throat> 
Now, it wasn't believed that this process of everyone acting in their own self-interest self would necessarily lead to kind of universal war, because it was believed that there are ways by which this competitive tension could be mediated, so to speak. It was the task of the diplomat or the foreign minister to preserve the peace by ensuring that no one nation ever became so strong that it could eat up all the rest. And that was the balance of power. How are they to achieve that? Well, by way of endless diplomatic maneuvers, alliances, treaties, whether open or secret, temporary coalitions, in extremity also by using joint military action to contain or defeat any one power that seemed to be over mighty, over powerful. All the things, by the way, of course, which George Washington in his great farewell address in 1796 said America should not get involved in. And that's an important point which we might want to talk about during the question session. So how did the balance of power look to the British towards the end of 1772, a year before the Boston Tea Party, but at the moment when the decisions were being made in London that would lead to the Boston Tea Party? Now, we don't need to speculate about any aspect of British policy at the time, British foreign policy, because the documentation is exceptionally good. Uh, one of the great glories of English archive collections is what are known as the State Papers Forum, which are in the National Archives in southwest London. And these basically contain every bit of diplomatic correspondence that flowed back and forth between the British government and foreign governments, or between the British government and British envoys in the courts of Europe and all the reports also that would come back from Europe to London. This includes all kinds of gems. It also includes a lot of documents, for example, that are in code or in cipher. Unfortunately, you can work out what they mean because the cipher books are provided too. There's a particularly wonderful collection within the State Papers Foreign, which is one that hasn't really been looked at too often by historians, which is the very early diplomatic correspondence between London and the first British envoys in Washington under the new, in, rather in Philadelphia, under the new American Republic. Those are absolutely fascinating because they're in very, very good condition. They can show you exactly how the British were interacting in the 1780s, the 80s and 90s with people like Andrew Alexander Hamilton and so on. Anyway, the State Papers Foreign are a wonderful collection, a wonderful treasure trove. So, late 1772, we happen to have one particular memorandum that is especially useful. It was written by a man called Lord Rochford on November the 12th, 1772. Now, at the time, the British didn't have one foreign minister. They actually had two foreign ministers, two secretaries of state. The senior secretary of state was Lord Rochford, uh, an extremely able and highly experienced diplomat, brilliant linguist. I regret to say that his personal morality did not match the quality of his diplomacy, but that was characteristic of the 18th century. He wrote this memo on November the 12th, setting out on just a few pieces, on a few sides of paper, a very acute and succinct appraisal of Britain's international situation. Now, I'd just like to start by referring to what he doesn't mention. He doesn't mention America at all. The fact is that nobody did. During the whole of 1771, 1772, and the first four months of 1773, America was not mentioned once in parliamentary debates. It is very hard to find any reference to America in the official correspondence of, for example, George III, all of which was published long ago during this period. Russia doesn't mention it either in this memorandum. Now, he knew all about an incident that had occurred nearly six months earlier on the coast of Rhode Island. That is to say that the Gaspé incident, where a British naval warship was destroyed by merchants and mariners from Providence. He knew all about that. He knew it was important. He knew it was important partly because the British government's most senior legal official, the Attorney General, had said it was five times worse than the riots against the Stamp Act. But even so, Rochford did not refer to that in this memorandum of his. Simply didn't register as an issue sufficiently important. What Rochford was talking about was something completely different. He wasn't looking westwards towards America. Didn't think there was going to be a revolutionary war. He was looking eastwards towards the perilous maelstrom of European politics. And this is what he wrote. The situation of Europe at this very instant is become so critical that it is the essential duty of administration to give their whole attention to it, their whole attention to Europe. Now, what was worrying him so much? 
Now, I appreciate that, of course, diplomats always say that the present situation at the present moment is always the most critical there has ever been. It's just a, what, what diplomats say to their colleagues. But in this case, I think he really believed it. Now, what was the new development that so alarmed Lord Rochford? Now, for many years, of course, the principal goal of British foreign policy had been the containment of France. Indeed, in the memo, Rochford describes France as, quote, our natural great rival, unquote. They were worried particularly that the French were about to try to recover their possessions they'd lost in India during the uh, Seven Years' War. But the big new factor, the thing that was really worrying Rochford and the thing that was, was most uppermost in the minds of the British government at the time was something else. It was the rise of Russia. That is to say, the decisive emergence in the 1770s of Tsarist Russia as by far the most powerful military power to the east of the Rhine. And as you'll see, as I proceed, the consequences of this, of course, are still with us today. October 1768, the Ottoman Empire had made the great mistake of declaring war on Russia. Turkey's aim is very simple, to prevent Russia from achieving its own strategic goal of unfettered access to the shore of the Black Sea. There followed the Russo-Turkish War of 1768 to 1774, which was a very big war indeed. Many more men involved than those who were involved during the American Revolutionary War. Fought out on an 800-mile front from the Danube to the Caucasus. The Russians won some brilliant victories, both at sea and on land. At sea, they sent a naval squadron all the way around the coast of France and Spain, through the Straits of Gibraltar, all the way to the Aegean, where it destroyed a Turkish fleet. It was a tremendous success for Russia, and it meant the Russians could, be, at a stroke, became an important commercial and maritime power in the Mediterranean. They won a great series of victories in Poland, which effectively quelled a Polish uprising. They won victories under generals with names like Rumyantsev and Suvorov against the Turks, which meant they consolidated their control of the Ukraine. They also began to establish their control of the Crimea, which became complete with the annexation of the Crimea 10 years later in 1783. And you can see why I said the consequences of this are still with us. Above all, and, and this was the, the, the event which was most upsetting to George III and his ministers, they undertook what was called the Partition of Poland in the middle of 1772, about the same time as the news of the Gaspé incident arrived in London. Essentially, Austria, Prussia, and Russia between them carved up Poland ending its independence. Now, this was the situation that Lord North and Lord Rochford were confronting at the end of 1772, early in 1773. They were worried that there would be a general European war. It seemed inevitable. A general European war with France on the one side and Russia on the other, breaking out either in the Baltic or the Mediterranean. And the Baltic was crucial to Britain because of what the Baltic produced. This was before the Industrial Revolution had really got underway. And so Britain was not yet actually the great manufacturer of iron and steel it would become. Sweden was the world's biggest producer of iron. And Prussia and Poland were the biggest producers in Europe of grain. And Britain needed Swedish iron, and it needed Prussian or Polish grain too. So a war in the Baltic would be very worrying. The British were also worried that, quite frankly, they would simply be drawn into the war on one side or the other. Now, against this background, the British were taking all the decisions about America when they came to make those decisions. Now, Lord North wasn't a man given to making PowerPoint presentations, as you can imagine, and using bullet points. <laughs> but if, let's say, Nor Lord North had been trying to put together a SWOT analysis in 1772-3 of Britain's position, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, what would he have come up with? Well, he would have come up with something like the following. First of all, he would not have said that Britain was especially strong militarily. Now, often, American historians make the statement that Britain was the world's greatest military power. They make this statement in the context, for example, of, of their assessment of the achievements of the Minutemen in New England. Well, it just isn't true. Britain was a long way from being the world's greatest military power. At the very peak of the American Revolutionary War, uh, in the year of Yorktown, the maximum strength of the British Army in all its theatres, not just in America, but in Europe and Asia as well, was about 150,000. The Russian army in the Russo-Turkish War was 300,000 strong. Now, in peacetime, the British Army was much smaller. In the early 1770s, the official maximum strength of the British Army was 37,000. 
In, in practice, in practice, it was always a lot smaller than that because units were normally under strength. 37,000 was what they called the establishment. It was what they drew the money for, for the wages. In practice, normally the units were maybe 75 or 80% of that figure. The Navy, of course, was Britain's, the jewel in Britain's crown. 130 large fighting ships in the British line of battle. But even there, there's a caveat. Now, the problem was that it was far too expensive to keep more than a handful of ships afloat at any one time. So the bulk of the Navy, the bulk of the big capital ships of the line of battle, were actually kept in dock in peacetime. Their masts were taken down. The sails and the rigging were, were stored on shore, and they had only skeleton crews. When it seemed likely that war was going to break out, they would then be rapidly mobilized. And that was one of the great British strengths. It was what they planned for, a rapid mobilization in time of war. So maybe within two or three weeks, they could get the bulk of the fleet out to sea. That was something which they worked very hard to achieve. And it was why the Admiralty, the Admiralty was, it was in excellent shape in the early 1770s in terms of its administrative capabilities. But nevertheless, as I say, they couldn't afford to keep more than a handful of ships afloat during peacetime. For Lord North and his colleagues, the really big strength Britain had was its commercial and financial prowess as a trading nation. That's what they really believed in. The Navy was great to have, but the Navy could only exist because of the wealth generated by the gunsmiths of, and the button makers of Birmingham or the textile weavers of Yorkshire or the cabinet makers of London or by the bankers and financiers of the city as well or, of course, by entities such as the East India Company. So what the British really believed in was, was their commercial prowess. That was the source of their strength. And they had a particular way of doing things, a particular way of managing their military and financial situation, and it was as follows. Now, today, we often hear people talk about a balanced budget. Politicians argue that governments should balance their budgets, that their expenditures should not exceed their income. And they often imply that at some time in the past, there were finance ministers who did balance their budgets, as though that was kind of the traditional way of doing things. But it wasn't. On the contrary, no British finance minister in the 18th and 19th century would ever have tried to balance his budget. What they did was they tried to have a surplus in peacetime. It was essential to have a surplus in peacetime, a significant surplus. The reason it was essential was because by doing so, you built up a kind of reserve fund that you could draw down in time of war. More specifically, you, 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 built, you, you maintained a high credit rating. Now, that was essential. Now, there were no Standard and Poor's or Moody's in those days, but nevertheless, there was public opinion, and there was a bond market. Now, you remember what Woody Allen said about the bond market, that if he were ever reincarnated, he would like to come back as a bond market because then he could intimidate everybody. And that, of course, is something the British would have understood. They would have understood the joke. There had indeed been a crisis in the bond market in 1770, 1771, because there was a war scare over the Falkland Islands. Britain and Spain very nearly went to war over the Falkland Islands in 1770. France would have joined in if, if Britain had gone to war with Spain. Gilt market fell, gilt market for British government securities, and that remained an issue that the British were very concerned about. So they didn't want a balanced budget. What they did was they wanted to have a surplus in peacetime. And Lord North spent a lot of his time trying to keep that surplus as healthy as possible. Now, I said he didn't give PowerPoint presentations, but he did give an annual budget speech. And the annual budget speeches given by Lord North are very revealing documents indeed. Now, they're a bit hard to get at because at the time, there were no verbatim official records of parliamentary debates. But they, they used to be reported in the newspapers. So you delve about in the newspapers and you find them. And this is what he said May the 1st, 1772. Thus we see what I believe nobody expected at the time of the last war. Some prospect of gradually reducing the national debt, a step which will necessarily raise our credit and authority in Europe and terrify our enemies into Pacific measures. And then he goes on to say, and this is a very succinct, compressed appraisal of his own strategy. For it is not only an armed force, not only great armies and great naval forces that will deter our rivals from violence, but the capacity of raising and strengthening these bulwarks when occasion calls. 
In other words, by having a sufficiently good credit rating out there in the bond market so that when you needed to raise money to, to get the army and out, to, out to Germany or wherever and get the Navy out to sea, you could afford to do so. Now, how was Lord North doing in 1772? Well, the answer is he was actually doing very well. The British economy at the time, the size of the British economy, most economy, economic historians would, would estimate it around about 130 million pounds sterling. The national debt was about 130 million pounds also. Now, that's not a very convenient place to be. Uh, if you have your national debt somewhere at or above your gross domestic product, then that's usually regarded as being a, a little bit dangerous. But in practice, it wasn't too bad from North, Lord North's point of view because actually he was consistently delivering surpluses, and so the national debt was gradually falling. And every year from 1768 to 1775, when he had full control of the public finances, Lord North delivered a budget surplus. Indeed, in one year, it was a million pounds, which was a, a, a big number in the context of the size of the British economy. Now, how did he do that? Well, he did it not by making bold strokes, he wasn't that kind of politician. He did it by lots and lots of what we in Britain would call hard graft, by strict economy, a policy of strict economy in, in public spending, and also by introducing small taxes and by improving lots of small taxes and by improving the collection of those that already existed. He also had some gimmicks too. For example, he introduced a, a peacetime lottery, which is a bit of an innovation. That was very popular, and that raised a million or so pounds. So he was doing pretty well. But... Although he was doing quite well, there was still no room for complacency. At the end of 1772, with Britain worried about the prospect of a general European war, which seemed almost inevitable in the light of the emergence of Russia in such strength, at the end of 1772, the problem was that Lord North had pretty much reached the limits of what he could achieve financially. He couldn't cut his expenditure any further, especially on the Navy. There was a very simple reason for that. It was because of something called block obsolescence. Now, the phrase block obsolescence is a, is a technical one. And what it refers to is this. Wooden fighting ships of the Royal Navy at the time had a finite working life. You couldn't keep them afloat, even if you were putting them in dry dock during peacetime. You couldn't keep them going for longer than, say, 20 or 30 years before they would have to be replaced. So the Navy had to run a, a rolling program of continual replacement of old ships. Now, the difficulty in the 1770s was a disproportionately large proportion of the Royal Navy was reaching the point of obsolescence when it would just have to be replaced. In addition, the Navy had come up with a very good new scheme, which was to put copper bottoms on the new ships that were produced, hence the expression copper bottoming. All of this would cost money. And therefore, there was, no need, there was no scope for any further reduction in the naval expenditure budget. Nor could Lord North cut the army anymore, because the army was already quite small and overstretched by commitments overseas of various kinds. So he couldn't cut his expenditure anymore. He also had a bit of a problem with his tax base, too. And the difficulty here was this. It was a combination of things. There was a thing called the land tax. Well, he couldn't increase the land tax anymore because the land tax was mainly paid by the small or medium-sized country landowners, and they were precisely the people who came to Parliament and formed the bedrock of Lord North's political support base. So he couldn't increase the land tax. There were difficulties caused by the rising price of provisions. Now, what was happening in the early 1770s in England was the price of corn was rising year by year. The price of food was rising year by year. And as a result, destitution, particularly in the countryside, was becoming more of a problem. The cost of relief for the poor was therefore rising year by year, and that was creating more pressure on the country landowners. There was also a problem with smuggling. I mean, smuggling was endemic throughout the 18th century, but it went in peaks and troughs. There was a kind of cyclicality to it. And all the evidence suggests that in 1772-3, to three, there was a particularly severe epidemic of smuggling, now, of course, it was occurring both in the British Isles and on the coast of America. It was rife in the Channel Islands, the British Channel Islands, which would take tea brought in by the French East India Company and then ship it to the southwest coast of England. It was rife in Ireland. It was rife on the southwest coast of Scotland. It was even happening close to London, Kent and Sussex. And it was becoming violent, organized crime. And, of course, also it was happening in America. Along the coast of America, 
the Gas Bay incident, which I referred earlier, was simply one of a number of incidents where the Navy found itself obstructed, the Navy and the customs officials found themselves obstructed by smugglers and their accomplices. Judges in America were refusing to swear out search warrants so that searches could be undertaken for suspected smuggled goods. Bribery again, there was corruption in the customs service. The customs service just wasn't working on either side of the Atlantic. And of course, the problem with the epidemic of smuggling was that it was cutting into the tax revenue from the excises and the customs on tea and alcohol and so on and so forth. There was also another more problem of principle, which was this. Because Lord North believed that Britain was fundamentally a commercial trading nation, it affected his fiscal policy. He was very reluctant to impose unusually high taxes on any one particular branch of trade for fear that it would destroy that particular branch of trade. I mean, for example, the beer duty was an obvious example. The, the, highest, the biggest single tax in terms of the amount of revenue produced was the excise duty on beer. Now, they realized they just couldn't increase it any further because the public wouldn't accept it and because the brewers refused also. Uh, the brewers were quite an important lobbying group, and the brewers protested at any attempt to increase the beer duties. Further. They were already very high. Lord North's principle, you see, was this. He believed that the tax net should be very wide. There should be lots and lots of taxes, each of which was relatively small, but there should be lots of them and lots of people contributing. He didn't have any particularly sophisticated concept about progressive taxation. Like that. That, none of that had been invented. He didn't really have any sophisticated way of measuring the, the fiscal burden and, and, and calculating how it applied it to individual groups of people in the nation. But he did believe that the tax base should be spread as widely as possible. It should be wide, it should be broad, but it should be relatively light. That was essential if Britain was to maintain its commercial prosperity. But of course it also meant <coughs> that in the early 1770s, with these pressures building up upon him, he couldn't really cut taxes, and he couldn't allow anyone to evade taxes either. Now, I think you can begin to see how all of this is converging towards the decision to send the tea to Boston. In late 1772, at roughly the same time as the memorandum written by Lord Rochford, it became very clear that the East India Company was in severe crisis. The story, the, the, the events that had led to that are, are charted in some detail in Empire on the Age. It's quite a complicated little story. Um, it bears a bit of a resemblance to the events depicted in the film The Big Short, which I was uh, watching on the, on the in-flight entertainment on the plane coming over yesterday. It's not a million miles away, actually, from what those kind of events. But anyway, the East India Company was in crisis, and it had to be helped. And it had to be helped for two reasons, really. First of all, because the East India Company was very heavily in debt, and its largest creditors were the government and the Bank of England. The worry was that if the East India Company went down owing millions of pounds, then it would bring down the entire financial system. And indeed, there had already been a banking crisis in the summer of 1772. But the other reason, which was probably really more important, was this, which was that the, the East India Company was so commercially important. If the East India Company collapsed, then what would happen inevitably would be this. The French East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and the Swedish and Danish East India Companies would immediately step in to take over the East India, the British Company's dominant position at Canton in the tea trade with China. That would be inevitable. And that would be a serious blow to Britain's commercial standing. So North really had no alternative but to do something to try and help the East India Company. So it was against that background that the British government and the East India Company began to work on the scheme to salvage the company's position by sending its very large stocks of unsold tea to America. Now, there were really four aims that Lord North had in mind. And again, you see, we don't need to speculate about what he had in mind because there, are, there is documentary evidence which tells us exactly what was going on in the heads of the British government. There's a memorandum which is preserved in the, in the British Library in London, a manuscript memorandum, which, which, which as far as we can see, is, is an official treasury position paper produced in January of 1773. It's part of the papers of a man called Lord Liverpool. Lord Liverpool was one of, of, um, of uh, Lord North's closest aides at the treasury. Four aims that they had. First of all, to help the East India Company. The East India Company had 17 million pounds of unsold tea in its warehouses in the city of London. Couldn't sell them on the market in England. Uh, so let's send them to America, sell them at a loss, but nevertheless bring in cash to salvage the East India Company's finances. 
That was one of their aims. But it wasn't actually crucial in terms of the East India Company's position because the government had already done something else anyway. Irrespective of that scheme, the government had already decided to lend the East, East India Company 1.4 million pounds, which they did. That was a separate measure, and that, was, that loan was approved, and the money was, was sent to the East India Company in the spring of that year, long before the tea ever arrived in, in Boston. And indeed, of course, very little money ever did come back to England from the tea sent to America because, because the tea wasn't sold. And yet it made actually no difference to the solvency of the East India Company because the loan had already been granted. The second thing Lord North wanted to do was to curb smuggling in North America. Now, the Treasury Board, that to say the committee which presided over the nation's finances in Whitehall in London, had been receiving a series of letters from America during 1772 and 1773 explaining just how bad the customs situation was on the American coast. They made it perfectly clear that the customs enforcement system was breaking down. What Lord North did was to adopt the tea scheme partly as a way to put the smugglers out of business by simply flooding the American market with competitively priced tea. The tea sold by the East India Company in America didn't need to be cheaper than the tea sold by smugglers. smugglers. It just had to be about the same price. And because it would be there in such large quantities and because it would be sold legally with no risk to the retailer, of course it would capture the market, bringing an effective end to the smuggling trade. Now, this particular part of the scheme appears to have been concocted partly by Thomas Hutchinson, the governor of Massachusetts, but more specifically by a man called William Palmer, who was Thomas Hutchinson's agent in London. In fact, I think it was actually Palmer who was principally responsible. He was a leading London tea merchant who went on to make a great deal of money and to acquire a very large country estate in Essex to the north of London. He's a bit of a shadowy figure who appears in some histories that accounts of the Boston Tea Party, but what I did in the book was to go a lot more into his role in this particular affair. I think he was the man who actually came up with this idea of flooding the American market. Third thing Lord North was trying to do was he was trying to raise revenue to pay the salaries of governors and judges in America. Now, this is an issue that had been kicking around between the colonies and the government for 50, 60 years or so, the issue of who should actually pay the salaries of governors and judges. Lord North wanted to be paid out of the duty on tea because it meant, therefore, that the salaries and the judges would be, that the governors and judges would be entirely independent of political interference from the likes of Samuel Adams and so on. So that was another another part of the, the motivation for sending the tea to Boston. However, it's important to bear in mind that the amounts of money that Lord North was trying to raise from the tea duty were actually pretty small. The tea imported into, sent to Boston, Philadelphia, and so on by the East India Company would only have produced a revenue of about 15,000 pounds by way of tea duty because the duty was only three threepence a pound. And we can estimate that figure of 15,000 pounds because it's possible to come up to quite robust estimates of the volume of tea consumption in America. We just assume that everybody in America was drinking roughly the same amount of tea per head as they were in Britain, and we can come up with very good estimates of what was being consumed in Britain, both smuggled and legal. Put, them all, put the figures together, and we can come up with an estimate that the tea duty would have produced 15,000 pounds. And that's actually quite a small sum. It's a very small sum, in fact. It, it, it pales into insignificance behind the total cost of running the British Army and administration in America, which is about 400,000. It pales into significance beside, for example, the yield on the coach and carriage duty in England. The duty on two-wheeled and four-wheeled carriages in England produced 85,000 pounds a year, which is much larger than 15,000 that the tea would have produced from America. In fact, the biggest single reason why Lord North sent the tea to Boston was this. He wanted to make the political point, or rather the politico-economic point. As I said earlier, it was essential for Britain to maintain its financial standing, to maintain its credit rating in the bond markets. It was essential to generate these peacetime surpluses. It was also essential to have a tax base that it was wide as possible, with everybody making some contribution, however small. And that was the point. By sending the tea to Boston, with a, three, with a threepence of duty attached to each pound of it, he would ensure that Americans paid some tax whether they liked it or not. He would establish the principle that Americans had to be part of the tax net so that when a war broke out and Britain really needed to raise lots of money, he could go back to the Americans and ask for more. Really, that was the point. It was a political gesture, but a very important one. And Lord North had been looking for an opportunity to do, opportunity to do that for a long time. 
Back in 1770, when he gave a big speech about American taxation, he made that point very clear. He said he wanted to ensure the Americans paid at least some tax so that they could be part of this very wide British tax base. So the T scheme was born as an initiative primarily from the Treasury working with the East India Company and with William Palmer, whom I just mentioned. But you see, re in the reality is this. In the last analysis, the T scheme was a kind of a side effect or a byproduct of all the other things I've been talking about this evening, about Britain's concern with the balance of power in Europe. The reason why the British were so concerned about their fiscal position at the end of 72 and 73 was because they believed a general European war was imminent. It was essential, however confident Lord North sounded in public, and he did sound very confident in public, it was absolutely essential to keep the tax revenues as robust as possible to allow for the building up of the Navy and the Army during wartime. From Lord North's point of view, the decision to send the tea to Boston wasn't some great big gesture. It wasn't a huge political gesture. In terms of, if we think of in terms of analogy with chess, it wasn't like moving a, a rook or a bishop or a queen. It was simply one of a number of maneuvers that he was employing at the time to try and ensure that his tax base was as resilient as it could be. Now, you might ask, was there another option? Were there any other options the British had? Well, there was. And it's one of the rather saddest ironies of this whole story. The reality is that at this particular moment in 1773, the British actually had another option, which was to forget 30 or 40 years of, of diplomatic policy, to change their attitude towards foreign policy entirely, and to abandon their, concern, con their preoccupation with the balance of power. Logically, you see, what they should have done in 1773 was to form an alliance with France. And indeed, strangely enough, George III himself actually suggested this. There is a document preserved in the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle, which is a memorandum written by George III in 1773. He didn't give an exact date to it, but it's very clear that it was written, uh, sorry, 1772. It's very clear that it was written in late 1772 because it refers to the partition of Poland. And what George III says is this. He says, the very extraordinary phenomenon of a coalition of the courts of Vienna, Petersburg, and Berlin to take what may suit their separate conveniences of Poland is a phenomenon so subversive of the balance of Europe that it of necessity must give rise to very extraordinary alliances amongst other powers. And then he makes a proposal for an alliance with France. He says, this plan may perhaps seem chimerical, but if Britain and France would, with temper, examine their respective situations, the ancient animosity would appear absurd, and that they have, by their animosity, aggrandized other powers and weakened themselves. In other words, George III was proposing, seriously, that Britain and France should do a deal and become allies. Now, this may sound extraordinary, but actually it wasn't so remarkable. The reality was the British had done that earlier in the 18th century. Very often, if you read popular histories of the 18th century, or even academic histories of, of Great Britain of the period, you would get the impression that Anglo-French rivalry and enmity was kind of inevitable. Some people actually use this expression, a hundred years war, the second hundred years war, to describe the wars between Britain and France between 1618 and the Battle of Waterloo, 89 and the Battle of Waterloo. This isn't true. Actually, there was a period of 30 years between 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht, and 1743, the War of the Austrian Succession, when Britain and France were at peace. And that was a period, actually, of great prosperity. You can actually argue, you can make the case that the 1720s and 1730s were probably one of the happiest periods in English history, the period when the standard of living of the rural poor, particularly, was at its best for many generations. In fact, it didn't, it, after that period, it deteriorated and didn't recover its 1720s, 1730 level till the mid-Victorian era. And that was partly the consequence of the policies of peace that were followed by Sir Robert Walpole, the British Prime Minister, and his French counterparts between 1713 and 1743. So it had been done before. There had also been a diplomatic revolution, so-called, in 1756, when France and Austria had abandoned many, many decades of hostility towards each other and become allies. So in fact, what George III was proposing, an Anglo-French alliance, was actually not as remarkable as it might sound. But of course, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because the British 
felt that their navy was sufficiently strong that it wasn't necessary. Instead of going for an alliance with France, which was actually seriously discussed, there were feelers put out. The British government and the French government each thought this was possibly a sensible idea. And there were some diplomatic feelers put out between the two in the summer of 1773. But it came to nothing because the dominant mood in the, British in the British government and the dominant mood in Parliament was they didn't need to do a deal with France because the Royal Navy was so strong. And what they actually did was this. Instead of doing a deal with France, they did something completely different. They staged an enormous naval review at Spithead on the south coast of England. And this is described in, in, in An Emperor on the Edge. It got the Royal Navy to parade at Spithead in front of George III and the French ambassador. And this was an unusual event because nothing of this kind had ever been held before. Now today, naval reviews at Spithead are quite a common British phenomenon. This was the first one. It was very, very successful. The French ambassador, Julia, wrote a report back to Paris. Reports soon arrived in London that the French Navy was being stood down. It had been rumored the French Navy was about to put to sea, possibly go to war with Russia. The French Navy was stood down. The review was a great success. It led to a mood of, of, of national pride and exaltation in London. And it was in that mood of pride, exaltation, and, and patriotic uh, fervor that Britain ended up stumbling into the Boston Tea Party and the... Uh, and what subsequently followed. The reality is this. If that deal had been done, if Britain had formed an alliance with France in the summer of 1773, and to be frank, one analyzes the international situation at the time, it made a great deal of sense. If that had happened, of course, events would have been turned out very differently. The tea certainly would have gone to Boston. No question about that. Lord North certainly would have sent the tea to Boston because he didn't associate in his own mind the issue of sending the tea to Boston on the one hand, with the, French, with the issue of an Anglo-French alliance or Anglo-French enmity on the other. He saw the, the, the sending of the heat of Boston as simply being, as I said, a kind of small maneuver on a much bigger chessboard. So the tea would still have gone to Boston. Probably there still would have been a Boston Tea Party. The British probably still would have reacted to it in a coercive fashion. But if they had been allied with France, of course, the American Revolutionary War would not have ended in the way it did. Samuel Adams himself, and this is a, a, a little interesting little feature of An Emperor on the Edge, a letter from Samuel Adams dated 1773, which I quote, Samuel Adams was perfectly well aware that the only prospect of America actually winning its liberty in the way he wanted to was if the struggle with Britain, between America and Britain, occurred at the same time as a kind of crisis in Anglo-French relations. He was perfectly well aware of that. So if Ang Britain and France had been allied, then it really would have been very difficult for him to take the kind of radical stance that he did in Massachusetts. There would, of course, have been no Yorktown because there would have been no French Navy. And the reality is, although there would have certainly been a collision between Britain and the colonies, there would certainly have been protests, there would have been disobedience, there would have been conflict, and eventually there probably would have been an American Republic of some kind, but it wouldn't have happened in the way it did. And, ladies and gentlemen, it's even possible that you might still be subject of Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> Now, on that note, uh, I began, as I say, with Tolstoy and I ended with George III. So on that note, I'd like to, to, to uh, invite any questions you may have. Please wait for the microphone. Americans certainly knew about the tax issue. How much more of this did they know about? How much did they know of what was going on? Uh, and, and how did that lead them to, to strategize? Well, that's a very good question. Now, they certainly knew what they read in the newspapers, of course, the British newspapers, uh, because the British newspapers were shipped over to America. Uh, they were received by people like Benjamin Franklin's successor, David Hall, at the Pennsylvania Gazette. They were printed in the American newspapers. So the Americans knew what they read in the British press. And the British press was often very well informed. And so the British press certainly kept the Americans informed about the diplomatic situation, and they certainly would have been able to read things like Lord North's budget speeches. Trouble was, though, of course, that some parts of the British press, particularly a newspaper with the London Evening Post, which is the most radical newspaper, were also putting across a completely different perspective on this. They were arguing there was actually a conspiracy in London by the government to subvert not only English civil liberties, but also American civil liberties. And I think instead of, of, of studying, if you like, the, the objective facts of the situation as the London newspapers were, were, were um, reproducing them, 
Americans were tending more to, to, to listen to what papers, radical papers like the London Evening Post were saying. However, there is another little uh, angle to this, which is this, which is that, of course, in London, uh, there were some very intelligent Americans who were very, very heavily involved in, in London politics. Now, I'm not talking about John Benjamin Franklin, I'm talking about the Lees, Arthur and William Lee from Virginia, who were associated with uh, John Wilkes, the English radical leader. And I think you did have an insight, probably a deeper insight, into um, British policy, uh, and certainly probably had a pretty acute knowledge of what was going on in terms of the T scheme. Now, the problem is that we don't actually have extant much of the correspondence of, John, of Samuel Adams. So we don't know what Samuel Adams was receiving by way of, if you like, secret or private intelligence from the Lees in London, who were so close to John Wilkes. Now, my guess is that if we had the full, if, if we had a, 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 what you feel like, the, the entire correspondence of, of Samuel Adams, both inbound and outbound, I think we'd have a much better idea of the answer to the question that, that you're asking, of exactly what Americans knew about British policy. I think the Lees probably were pretty well placed and could have told him, but as I say, a lot of that correspondence just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you mentioned Washington's farewell address earlier on, if you could yeah. elaborate on that. Well, what I had in mind was that the sections of the farewell address that deal with, with foreign policy, basically they, they make it very clear that what, what Washington wanted to do was for, precisely for America not to get involved in the kinds of diplomacy that were current in Europe. Because this European obsession with the balance of power gave rise to, as I said, an awful lot of, of secret treaties. It gave rise to an awful lot of, of deceptive conduct. Um, and, of course, eventually it was utterly destructive. I mean, by the time Washington wrote the farewell address, of course, in 1796, the Napoleonic Wars were well underway. And they weren't called the Napoleonic Wars then, because they were just the French Revolutionary Wars, but they were well underway. And Washington could see, I think, that, that a very destructive process was underway in Europe, which would lead to, to a tremendous loss of life, which it did. And, of course, it led to the rise of Napoleon and so on and so forth. I think the point I'm making is that, that I think what Washington understood was that this was the kind of end result, the kind of inevitable end result of the kind of balance of power politics that, British pol that European politicians had been uh, indulging in for many decades. Now, European politicians believed that the balance of power was something they could kind of manipulate and they could produce peace out of the balance of power. The trouble with balance of power thinking was that every nation in that kind of scenario has an incentive to try and maximize its own benefit. And eventually that's going to produce kind of inevitably one conflict after another. And, and that's the point I had in mind, that I think Washington had a, a fairly profound understanding of what was wrong with the way that Europeans had been running their diplomatic affairs for maybe 40, 50, 60 years. Yes. When you positive, sort of counterfactual. Yeah. Had this British alliance occurred, would you care to speculate with North America as it looks like now? Would you know Louisiana purpose? All right, it's a very difficult one, isn't it? Because, of course, I mean, there are all kinds of issues. I mean, there's issues going about the West Indies. Because, uh, of course, you see, from the French point of view, the thing, you know, the part of America that was really important to them was Haiti. It was, it was that, that was what really mattered to the French, because, of course, the, the huge, it was a huge, huge sugar producer. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's very hard to say, isn't it? Because, of course, you know, there's, there's also questions, for example, about what, what would have happened to the slave economies? Uh, would they actually have continued, would slavery continue to flourish as a system if there had been an Anglo-French alliance? Maybe it would have done, I don't know. You see, of course, there wouldn't have been a French Revolution, because the French Revolution, of course, was in a sense, the, the, again, the, kind of the end result of the huge financial burdens that the French incurred in order to fight on the side of the Americans during the Revolutionary War. Uh, there would have been no French Revolution, in which case, you know, well, there are all kinds of different sort of, of, of uh, there are all kinds of different um, possibilities. I mean, I, I do honestly think, though, that, that irrespective of all of this, there still would have been a parting of the ways between Britain and America, because the fact of the matter is the British simply didn't take the trouble to understand what was going on in the colonies. There were so many issues that were, that were potentially going to be flashpoints, particularly the question of the Western frontier, um, and the quality and the caliber of the British colonial governors was so low that it was kind of inevitable that there would be continual uh, points of tension, so there would be some parting of the ways. It just wouldn't have happened in quite the way it did. Yeah. 
When you speak of the balance of powers having influenced 18th century thought, in America at least, since the Spanish-American War, and as far as I can see, England and Europe ever after, that is all that seems to guide the, what, who's in alliance with who, and even now in Syria, we see this whole strange balance of powers argument for who's involved, and the Russians come in, the Russians left yesterday. Do you see that it's changed, Eddie, or is this oh, just yeah. the ongoing policy? Can you comment on that? No, it has that? changed. No, no, it has changed. I mean, yeah, no, it has It's not the same kind of conception of the balance of power at all, really. I mean, everything changed more or less after the Battle of Waterloo. I mean, the Congress of Vienna and all the various treaties and alliances were formed after that, but were intended to be kind of permanent, you see. The point about the balance of power thinking in the 18th century was that it, it wasn't kind of permanent. They expected, uh, as a kind of as a way of life, as a fact of life, that people could, could keep shifting and changing their positions. There'd be kind of endless maneuvering and endless jockeying, and there was no kind of, there was no kind of permanence about the arrangements that existed. Now, today we're not in that situation. When you think of the European Union. I mean, that's a pretty permanent kind of entity. I mean, that's not a product of balance of power thinking. That's why I think it's actually quite hard to get into the mindset of people in the 18th century diplomats and foreign ministers because we just don't think in those ways at all. Um, I mean, I think Syria, of course, is, 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 it might be the exception to that. I mean, I think what's happening at the moment, the way I would look at it, is that nobody has yet really worked out exactly what the, the consequences are, the full consequences of the end of the Cold War. And it's, it's hard to see exactly what is, after all, it's only what? It's only what, I mean, 25 years since the end of the Cold War. And I think we, we have still yet to see an order emerge as a kind of successor to the order that we had during the Cold War. I mean, of course, during the Cold War, which is what most of us grew up with, it was always a lot easier to understand what was going on, wasn't it? Uh, and I think, you know, it's much easier to understand what was going on. Uh, and now, of course, we face a situation where I don't think we're quite clear what principles, if any, govern uh, the ways in which the, uh, the world's great powers actually can gut their affairs. There's a kind of bit of a vacuum, or I see there's a kind of a vacuum in sort of the analysis of international politics in the way that there wasn't, you know, during the, uh, during the post-war period from 1945 to 1990. That's not really much of an answer to your question, but that's sort of the best one I can give, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sir, <clears throat> my question, uh, it was my understanding that uh, the colonists were also very concerned with the fact that they didn't feel like they were being treated as full uh, British citizens. And was right. there any discussion at the time in Britain about going in the opposite direction? Uh, was there, were there any proposals or discussion about making the colonies you know, full members in the British Empire yes. and also uh, representation in Parliament. Yes, I mean, the, the, the man most closely associated with that, of course, is Adam Smith, the economist Adam Smith, he did propose that. But the difficulty, of course, first of all, he took so long to write The Wealth of Nations that it didn't actually appear until after the war had begun, you know. I mean, if it, he actually nearly finished it, I think, about 1771, and then he decided it wasn't good enough, so he went back. But, of course, he was an academic. He was a professor at uh, Glasgow University, I think it was. But, um, no, but there was. There was discussion of that kind. And, of course, it's, it's important to remember that, that once the war was, 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 once it was clear that the war was being lost, and once it was clear that there was going to be a deal, and once the British had done the deal, uh, the, the Peace of Paris between Lord Shelburne and Benjamin Franklin and so on, actually the British then did become a lot more creative in their thinking once the war was over. During the 1780s, there was actually a period between 1783 and the French Revolution when the British actually went through a, a quite remarkable period of reform and they came up with all kinds of new ideas. They had an Anglo-French commercial treaty. They were very quick, actually, to, to try and put out feelers to America, I think, in reality, in, 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 when we think about what are in the context of which that occurred. So they all kind of created things the British did, and their thinking actually developed very rapidly after that period. But in the period before the war, no, it wasn't. I mean, those sorts of ideas, although they were being mooted, they weren't entering into official, uh, official, into official discourse at all. They would have been seen as kind of visionary schemes. And also, famously, nobody really read The Wealth of Nations. That's the point. Scholars have made a big, you know, there's been a, a, quite a prolonged effort in the UK by scholars to try and determine how much influence Adam Smith actually had. And the reality is probably didn't have any influence until about 10 years after the book was published. Then it started to have a lot of influence. Yeah. One of the... Um, things that I took away when I was reading your book is that Britain regarded the colonies as their captive market, yeah. that literally all their goods, they didn't have to worry. 
about the colonies or anything like that. And I'm wondering if that isn't partly why Britain just ignored them or turned their back and, and, and just literally said all is taken care of or we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it, really. I mean, there's, there's the, the memorandum in, in which the book refers to at length by Lord Hillsborough, uh, the Hillsborough Memorandum, which is 1771, I think, or 1772, which basically says just that. It says, look, the reason the colonies are important is because they, uh, they provide seamen for the Royal Navy. And I don't even sure if that's actually true. They always used to say that, but I'm not quite sure how many Americans there were in the Royal Navy, but they certainly used to say that. Um, but but the, the, indeed, they did. They, they argued that the great value of the colonies was that they provided a, a market for British manufactured goods. And indeed, they did provide a market for British manufactured goods. And that was one of the principal reasons. But there was no great perceptive analysis being done of that. Now, when Adam Smith, again, when the Wealth of Nations appeared, Adam Smith did go into great detail about all that kind of thing. And his argument, of course, was precisely that even if there, were no, there was no obligation for Americans to buy manufactured goods from Britain, they still would. And indeed, they still did. So it wasn't really necessary. But that certainly was, yes, it was a major element of British thinking. Going to the Claremont review of your book, um, the, ed the reviewer finds the book to be fantastic. I agree, even though I haven't finished it. But his contention is that at the end, uh, your hypothesis that the American Revolutionary War would not have been won had it not been for the French alliance uh, he finds a contention with that because he believed after 1777 um, that the war was turning against Britain and that as long as the Howe brothers were in charge of the conflict, it was probably headed downhill. Do you concur? Well, it depends what you mean by won or lost, doesn't it? I mean, the thing is that the... Uh, the it wouldn't... Certainly, if the French had not been involved, if, the French, if there had been no French support at all, uh, if the French had simply been included, then the British would have been free to, to deploy a far larger strength, much larger than the Royal Navy, and in much larger strength than it was. Now, even if they hadn't been able to win the war on land, they wouldn't necessarily have been to win the war on land. That would have presented formidable difficulties. The full deployment of the full strength of the Royal Navy in American waters would have meant that it was certainly impossible for the Americans to win. And the British could have made it very, very uncomfortable indeed for, for the, the new American Republic, given this, 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 the, the kind of control they could have exercised over maritime trade. So, you know, but to be frank, it's not actually an essential part of the argument of Empire on the Age anyway. I mean, I deliberately, in an Empire on the Age, ended the book just before Lexington. I mean, Lexington is referred to at the end of the book, um, but the book really ends at the moment at which the, the, the two ships arrive from London, the Falkland Nautilus, with the dispatch to General Gage, which sends the troops up the road to Lexington. But I specifically decided, because the military history is a completely different and much more complex, in many ways, much more complex area. I mean, there's one really great book, I think, about it by a British scholar, Maxie, Piers Maxie, called The War for America, which was produced in the early 60s. And that's the book which I think is probably the best on the subject. Um, but it is a formidably complicated subject. And, and frankly, I don't regard myself as a military historian. I think military history is a specific kind of skill, a specific area of expertise that, that is really takes kind of a lifetime's work. And I don't regard myself as, as a military historian. Uh, and so that's why I don't, you know, I stopped the book short uh, in 1775. <laughs> yeah. There's a reception waiting outside, and uh, uh, Mr. Bunker will be out signing books for you. We're going to go through this door here. Nick, Nick, I'll turn this door. Very good.